Well, thank you all so much for being here. I first would like to introduce Nicholas Maggard. He is um, our wonderful host today, and he will be asking, you will be asking questions to him because he's the expert. So Nick believes that a person's estate is never just about how much money you have, but what stories make up your life. He works at Legacy Retirement and Estate Planning, and to him, you're more than just a client, you're a friend. So his approach to Legacy Retirement and Estate Planning is about preserving your memories and your legacy as much as protecting your wealth. So he'll give uh, a brief you know, presentation, and then this is an interactive session because he wants you to ask questions. You have the ear of an expert. So I hope you will um, ask questions and take notes, and you can unmute yourself, ask a question. You can put it in the chat if you don't want to talk out loud or um, whichever you prefer. So I, I guess I'm done now. So hi, Nick. Thanks for being here. Hi. Thank you guys. Appreciate you all for uh, having me on. Can I get a little bit of um, information on how what kind of topics you want me to cover? I mean, I'm guessing, you know, estate planning or senior care or elder law or maybe protection in the event of having to go into, you know, a lot of my clients will talk to me about if I have to go into a nursing home, do I have to spend down my house and, you know, all my assets and cost of care, how to pay for it. But just to kind of get an idea, what are some of the things that you, that everyone here is is, is interested in? Uh, you can, uh, Dave, you're muted. If you can click on mute. Muted. There you go. Uh, two questions I had was uh, one uh, about the uh, 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 uh Paying down your assets and turn and for a nursing home when you run out of money, um, and the uh, and the second was what uh, was avoiding probate. Okay, that's perfect. And Anybody one else in the, in the chat wrote estate planning. Estate planning, yep. Good. Um, Margaret, you're muted. If you wanna, I know I've just unmuted myself. Um, do I have to raise my hand? <laughs> no, you can just uh, yeah. okay. say what your, your question uh, is. Two things, uh, Nicholas. I, I'm interested in the what you said about preserving memories and legacy, not just uh, wealth. And the other thing is uh, some help about writing a will as opposed to a trust. Okay, that's perfect. Wills versus trusts. Okay, and legacy. Pat, uh, go ahead. You have your hand up. <clears throat> yes. Um, so my question is, um, I'm very concerned about, I guess, elder law would be the the um, general topic, elder law. Um, I see and I hear, and it's also happened to me, where people are taken advantage of by um, construction firms or, you know, just they find out that you're alone. They find out that, you know, you're you're an elderly widow person um, and they don't ever return your phone calls. You know, you've paid them to do something. Then there's a problem and then they never call you back. You back even though their work is supposedly guaranteed for 25 years. They don't, they don't come back. There's every excuse in the world. So I'd like to know you know, what options do we have when things like that happen? Okay. Thank you. That's good. All right. Well, appreciate everybody jumping in and uh, sharing with me kind of how I can narrow the topics when I get taught. Um, I've been doing estate planning and elder law for a long time now. I started practicing in 2008. Um, and so over a decade of uh, just kind of, this is my niche. I don't have any other areas of law. Um, you know, you ask me family law questions or immigration law or different areas of law. It's just not my, it's just not what I do. I have been quoted in the Wall Street Journal and Chicago Tribune, MSN Money, World News Reports. These are all national publications where they interviewed me and quoted me in their publications for these topics. Um, I'm appointed with the United States Tax Court of Appeals, 2014. 
Um, I was involved in legislation where we drafted the UTC, which is a uniform trust code. Susie Orman, anybody familiar with Susie Orman? Of course. Yeah. She, uh, she recommends if you're going to get an estate plan done or a trust done to utilize an attorney trained by the Estate Planning Academy of Attorneys, which I went through that training uh, for about a year, um, a while ago. And this is, this is what I do. I give a lot of talks. Uh, today is more um, me just kind of volunteering my time. And I, what I'd like to do then is I'd like to just share with you some of the, the core concepts that relate to the questions you just brought up and give you information, right? A lot of information about that. And then if there's anything and you know, very particular that you would like to follow up with, then we'll do that as well. Um, and then that'll be it. Um, so we'll start off with uh, the two topics of estate planning and long-term care planning or elder law. We'll, we'll, we'll start with the long-term care. There are a few ways to pay for long-term care. Well, first of all, long-term care is not a short-term illness, right? It's a, it's a chronic condition. Usually you, you have need for activities of daily living, aid and attendance needs. Maybe you have need help with bathing or incontinence or transferring or your fall risk, um, eating, you know, just, just basic living. Um, and maybe the doctor takes your driver's license away. And now, you know, one of my clients is homebound and, you know, how do we pay for these care, this cost of care that to get assistance? Well, you can self-pay. That's where you spend your own money. That's the first way, right? The second way is you use insurance, long-term care insurance, but a lot of families just don't have long-term care insurance or they can't qualify for it or when they try to apply for benefits, they get exclusions that take them out of it um, and, and or at the age they need it the most, the insurance company says, hey, we're gonna raise the rates and then they end up dropping the policy. So there's there's some, it's difficult to have the insurance route, but it is a possibility. It's a way to pay for long-term care. A third way is Medicare, but Medicare is not uh, reliable for the long-term. Medicare will pay 20 days if you go from a hospital into a skilled nursing facility. And then they'll pay 80 days a percentage, but they're done at 100 days. You can't rely on Medicare. Medicaid, however, is a federal state program, and they will pay for the whole nursing home bill. And most middle class families that I work with end up having to go into, if they, if they have to go into a nursing home, they end up having Medicaid pay the whole bill. But in order for Medicaid to pay the whole bill, you have to spend down all your assets. So you basically broke. And then there's nothing left and then Medicaid kicks in and pays. So let's say on this side of the, your screen, right, is all the assets that you have to spend down. Let's call that, if you're taking notes, countable assets. Okay, because I want to share with you something here. Countable assets spend down. Now, assets on this side of your screen are considered non-countable assets. You don't have to spend these assets down. If you go into a nursing home, you can keep all the assets that are classified and categorized as non-countable. It's sometimes referred to as exempt assets, right? So an elder law attorney's job is to reposition. How do we meet with somebody and reclassify their assets that are considered um, countable where you spend it down and move it over here to where it's safe it's protected it's not it's not countable you, you can put you know five hundred thousand dollars here in this pot and if you go into a nursing home medicaid's going to pay the bill but they can't go after your house or or however we classify it right and there are different ways to reposition assets um, the most common way you probably have heard of it is called a trust and it's a, it's a specific kind of trust. And you have your property deed that's in your individual name, which could be exposed to creditors and probate and all this stuff, right? Because when you die, you know, it's in your name. If you're disabled, again, Medicaid and the nursing home, you know, the government, they're going to go after assets that are in your name that are countable. So you just take your name off of the asset. You put your trust name on 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 the deed or the card title or the bank account 
or the brokerage account where stocks are. Now, a lot of times, in order to set this trust up, we have to designate somebody else, like your child or somebody else as the trustee. Not all the time, but a lot of times we designate somebody else as the trustee. So it's your trust, it's tied to your social security number, but we've listed somebody else as the trustee. And the trustee is the person that manages the trust assets. Now, you still have the right in this trust to change the trustee. You can fire the trustee if they don't listen to you, right? You have control over the trustee. In the trust, you also have the ability to change the beneficiaries. So if the trustee is a beneficiary, you have leverage over that beneficiary because you could just disinherit the kid. And, you know, well, they're going to want to comply with mom or dad because otherwise they get nothing, right? or you just replace them and appoint someone else as the trustee. The thing though is, if you go into a nursing home, your name or you can't be, you know, you can't be, it has to be someone else has to, you know, be the trustee, right? That's, that's, how, that's how it works. It's not in your name, it's in your trust. It's still your trust. You're not putting it in your kid's name. Here's the thing when you put property into your kid's name. One, you lose complete control. And a lot of my clients don't want to lose complete control. Two, if the child has any sibling issues or you have other kids, there could be an issue with that, right? Three, if that child who you transferred your house into their name, if that child is in a creditor claim, maybe they got in a, a car accident and there's somebody suing them, they're going after assets that are in the kid's name, which means that your house or your assets that you put in the kid's name is subject to the liability risk that's associated with the child, which might not be what you want. The other thing too is, when you transfer a property into the name of your child, what you've paid for your property is your cost basis, right? And how do you calculate taxes when property sold? Well, you look at your cost basis, usually what you paid for it, and then you look at what it's sold for. Let's say you pay $200,000 for a house right? That's your cost basis. When it's sold, it's $300,000, we'll just say, hypothetical. So now it's appreciated $100,000 in taxes or in, in gain. It's appreciated $100,000, that gain. And a lot of times when you pass away, we want to figure out what's taxable and what's not, not taxable. When you gift property to a child, you gift it to them, right? It's called carryover basis. They are gifted the property and thus they're gifted your basis in the property. So then their basis is your basis, 200,000. When you pass away and they sell the property, they're gonna have to pay capital gains tax on that appreciation because you made a gift while you're alive. It's much better to have it flow to the child in a trust because the trust is going to give them a step up basis. Where on this side, we were doing a carryover basis. So what's a step up basis mean? You pay two hundred thousand dollars. It's sold for you know three hundred thousand dollars, right? Basis versus the trust is going to do this. When I die, the basis of my property is not what I paid for it. The trust is going to say the basis of the property is stepped up to the market value at date of death. So your basis gets stepped up to the market value at your death. You get a brand new basis. So if your basis is at your death, 300,000, it's sold for 300,000, how much is it appreciated? Zero, because the trust wiped out all the appreciation in your real estate or anything, stocks, you don't have to be home. If, the, if appreciation zero, then what's tax? Zero. So when you look at doing a trust, you wanna make sure that you're gonna get a step up basis to wipe out taxes but you're also gonna to wanna to make sure that it's not in your name, it's in the trust name. So if you go into a nursing home, then you don't have to spend down those assets that are in the trust name. What are some other exempt assets? Well, a prepaid funeral plan is an exempt asset. A burial plot would be an exempt asset. There's not a lot. Uh, for most people, they don't want to lose their home. That's their largest asset. 
And so we look at creating a trust and transferring the property deed into the name of your trust. We just got to figure out who the trustee is going to be. Okay. Um, there's also another way to pay for long-term care. Cause I mentioned, if you remember, um, self pay insurance, Medicare, but that's not long, long term. And then, and then Medicaid, right? Which is, you know, looking at what is countable and what's not countable. The fifth way is VA benefits. So if you are a veteran or a surviving spouse of a veteran and you serve during a wartime, like Vietnam, then the VA has a, uh, a non-service connected benefit that can go to you. It doesn't matter if you were injured during war or not. It has to do with your injuries that are war related. Um, there didn't have to be any nexus to your service. It's just simply you need home care or you need to go into an independent living facility or an assisted living facility, or you need um, your daughter or your niece or your son to come over to the house and provide some assistance because you got to a place where you can't drive anymore. You're, you're a fall risk. And, and rather than you paying the child or the person money, and then, you know, not getting really much in return, you could apply for this VA benefit and the VA will pay the child or the beneficiary or, or the person who's providing the, the assistance that that's another type of way to pay for VA or for uh, long-term care. So there are different ways to pay for the or uh, for long-term care expenses. Now let's we, we can do some think of some questions if you have questions related to that. But let me shift gears to estate planning. Estate planning is going to come down to if you pass away, what's the easiest, smoothest way to get your assets to your beneficiary, right? Whether if you don't have any children, then maybe it's um, to next of kin or close friend or charity or church, right? Um, but whoever your beneficiaries are, what's the fastest way to get the ask to your beneficiaries? And what a lot of people look at doing is trying to avoid probate because probate has a delay, you know, the national average is 18 months, you know, but you might see it at, you know, 10 months. That's a delay, right? Um, if you have property in more than one state, you got to have a probate in each state where property is located. Some other reasons to avoid probate is the cost. The cost is around three to six percent your estate. So you know, you four percent of your estate, if you want to average it out, that's the national average too, is four percent. So it doesn't matter what state you're in. You look at your probate estate value up how much you have and then multiply that by 4% and you're going to get an idea of what probate fees are. And a lot of people want to avoid probate fees. So if you pass away and you're married, everything's going to go to, everything could go to your spouse, but when the spouse dies, it's all going to go right into probate. If you are a widow, then when you pass away, it's going to go into probate. And if you have a last will and testament, that means that you have to go to probate because the will is just a piece of paper until a probate judge declares it a valid will. It's executed properly. And then he goes through the whole probate process, probating the will, right? So the ways around probate, if you want to get around it, would be the trust. You pass away and the trust says in there, when I die, my trustee is going to distribute all the property, you know, to my beneficiaries exactly the way I want them to, right? So there's no need to go to probate. It just automatically goes to your beneficiaries and it's much more smooth and easy. And, and because of that, there's no need to pay that 4% probate fee because you transferred your property that way. Now, there are some things that you could avoid probate with, like without a trust, like uh, retirement accounts, if you have your beneficiary designations on there, right? Uh, life insurance will avoid probate because it has beneficiary designations on there. But I'm just, I'm, I'm mostly worried about, you know, people's home or their real estate where there are no beneficiaries on that. 
you know, someone's car, you know, personal property. Those are the those are the most popular things that transfer into the name of your trust, and then you get that distributed out. Um, you could, you know, also, yeah. I want to answer another uh, topic. Uh, it might have been Pat that brought it up, but I I have over the years, not as frequent as some of my other questions that I get from clients, but I'd say maybe a few times a year I'll get someone to call me. And I, I'm thinking of this one uh, lady who called me, and it was a roofer who put a roof on, um, who put a roof on her house, and he he did it like he did a bad job. He stopped returning her calls. Um, he you know she couldn't get it fixed, and she didn't know what to do, right? And so you you get that a lot. You get a lot of situations where the older you get, the more some people try to take advantage. Um, you, you, you know, you also see fraud and you see theft and you see, you know, it on the criminal level as well, but it might not be the criminal level. Maybe it's on the civil level. Um, and a lot of fraud is done. Mo a lot of it is done by the children. You know, children can be one of the, uh, and the often the most likely person. Um, so you got to you know, look at when you're designating who your trustee is. And in addition to a trust, we always recommend people do a power of attorney as well. So then when you're designating your power of attorney and you're designating your trustee, it is crucial to choose the right person. You got to trust the trustee and you got to trust the power of attorney. You could designate two people. And then you have the two co-agents you know, agents co-sign off on everything. You have them act jointly. And that can give some accountability, right? One person is less likely to do damage if they have to get consent from these other people. You could have three people as co, but two is is very common. Um, that way, it's not too cumbersome on the trustees or the or the power of attorneys to get all these signatures, and that can help protect. The other way to help protect against scenarios like that is to be able to have the right resources to contact, especially more in the scenario of someone came to your house and like the lady who had her roof um, half done and, and wasn't able to get any resolution on it. So having people that she can call, one would be an attorney that she could call who could write a letter to the company and say, you know, a demand letter. Um, and then basically if you don't get any compliance, then can begin the process of litigation. Another resource could be the attorney general. And the attorney general has departments where they can jump in um, and help um, investigate. And then obviously, if it's on the criminal level, then you have the ability to go to your local police. Uh, and the prosecutor is the one who can bring file charges um, to to then get restitution to pay any kind of damages. Um, there's not a lot of um, much I can say that I'm personally aware of. I just know that if you have a, a contact list and you have important people that you can call, friends, family, some uh, some attorneys that you trust, the attorney general, um, you know, you 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 have a team that is be that way, that way they you're not alone, right? and you have the support to be able to help with those situations. Regarding estate planning, because it looks like we have a comment about estate planning and stocks and investments. Estate planning and stocks and investments, a lot of that comes down to putting a plan in place. You remember me sharing with you how if you create a trust and you transfer your assets into the trust and you go into a nursing home, they can't touch it? Well, that asset protection doesn't occur until five years after you transfer your assets into the trust. So if you put everything you own into a trust and you go into a nursing home the next year, the trust is not going to shield your, your home from the nursing, from the, you know, the spend down. It has to be in the name of the trust for at least five years. Now, let's say you go into a nursing home four years from now. Well, you didn't make it past that five year mark. So you just self-pay until you get past the fifth year, and then 
it's protected, right? So you, you have this fight. That, so to answer the question about estate planning and, and things like that, a lot of these things come down to doing it in advance, pre-planning, as opposed to crisis planning. In my world, that's kind of how I've always classified things. You do it in advance or you do it in the crisis. Um, and it's a, you're very, very limited in your options and your choices if you have, if you delay, if you wait. You know, just it's just the way it is, right? Um, and so having your team together, having all of your estate planning documents together, I recommend not only the trust, but having a new will, and the will says everything goes to my trust because once it goes in your trust, then it gets distributed out the way you want to. So a trust, a will, a power of attorney for financial matters, an advanced directive, which is basically a medical power of attorney, a living will, which is your end of life, you know, pull the plug document, personal property memorandum. We recommend a personal property memorandum. That's where you can write down so your trust can say everything goes to my heirs or whoever, you know, with these percentages. And then it says, if I want to make a specific gift, I can do so in a personal property memorandum. And now you have this legal document it's called a personal property memorandum. You describe the item and you put the beneficiary's name next to it. And you can fill that, that memorandum out on your own. You don't have to go to your attorney to keep updating your specific gifts. We also give people, in addition to the personal and property memorandum, and it's connected to it, it's a legacy packet. And it's questions about you, right? Where did you go to school? What was your, who were your parents? What were they like? You know, what, who was your first kiss? You know, all these, you know, questions about you. Um, and then that can be included with the personal property memorandum, which is included with the power of attorneys and the will, which is included with the trust. And now you have everything organized, right? And everything's in one place. I remember Claire's day, this, this daughter, she, she was uh, my client's daughter. She comes into the, co the conference room. She's crying. She had this box and all this paperwork. I and mean, it was like, it was a mess. And she said, you know, Nick, I don't, I have no idea what my mom owned. I don't know. I don't know where her stuff is. You know, does she have, is this life, in, was she paying on this life insurance policy? You know, it, where is everything? It was so unorganized and it was so sad. And so it's it's a mission of mine to help people leave behind, if they can, you know, everything as a good steward, right? I know when I had some tragedy in my life and we couldn't find a lot of these documents. And we even had some people in the family fight over some jewelry. It was it was, it's just, it was just ridiculous, right? And if we can help people fight and prevent these fights, well, we can do so by just getting things in writing, getting things organized, maybe having a conversation with your trustee and your power of attorneys, maybe giving them a list of key names to call. I recommend if you have a trustee or power of attorney, once your, all your documents are set up, to have a phone conference with me and have them join the phone call just to introduce themselves and me introduce myself, right? That way it's less intimidating when there is a crisis. So that's kind of the, the big picture, trying to address, you know, everything that you guys brought up. I think we can shift into specific questions if you have it. Although there's no legal advice in this Zoom meeting, this is a public, there's no attorney client relationship that, you know, is being established. So you know, client confidentiality can't be applied here. Just trying to provide a free resource. So, you know, if you're going to ask a question, you know, it's it's a general, you know, hypothetical almost, but a general question. So that way, um, you know, if you decide to go forward with doing a trust, we could go through the engagement at that point. But, um, but yeah. Yeah, good. Really good stuff there. Yeah. If you have questions, don't say, you know, your social security number or anything that's personal. No. Um, I had a question. So when you put your stocks and investments into your trust, is it still like, is that money still like accessible? Like if you needed to, you know, buy something like, you know, your trust is there, but the money's safe, but you can still use it. It's not like you can't access it, right? Right. Um, yeah. So let me see here. Let me just... Okay. Um, 
if you have a trust and a lot of times what we do is we leave the personal checking account outside of the trust and we we create a new checking account in the name of the trust especially if we're designating somebody else as the trustee and then so now we just open up a free checking account in the name of the trust just a simple checking account we put maybe a thousand bucks in there whatever you want to put it some people put ten thousand dollars in there because that bank account will act as a prepaid or you know as a way to pay funeral expenses um, and then you go to all your other checking accounts and savings accounts at your bank and you list the trust as the POD, payable on death. So those other accounts will then get rolled into your this, this bank account that's in the name of the trust at death. The reason why that's most preferable is you can keep your personal check accounts title the way they are. You still have 100% control of it. Nothing's changed. You're just designating a death beneficiary as your trust. Um, and if you have any direct deposits going in, all that can stay the same, right? So the stocks, we a lot of times would death, put that in the name of the trust. Um, and then, yeah, you, um, if you have it at a brokerage account and there's a username and password, you know, you can have, have access to that too. Um, but, you know, we, we'd have to break it down, you know, a little bit piece by piece to kind of get more specific, but that's, yeah. Hopefully that helps. Yeah, thanks. Uh, how long does it take to set up a trust? Three Is weeks. That something you do in person, and um... yeah. So the first the first phone call, the first meeting is a phone call, and then the second meeting is a signing meeting, and that uh, um, depends on where you are, whether we're gonna mail you the trust or whether we're gonna you know we're gonna meet with you, uh, you know if you're nearby. Um, like I'm in Hampstead and uh, Stephen Troll, which is um, the, the attorney with my group as well, um, he is in Raleigh. Um, anything outside of that, we got to, you know, figure out a way to meet halfway or, or something like that. But um, so the, the first meeting is a phone call where we're getting all information. The signing meeting, which is the second meeting, is um, is in person. Now, what we do is we do a phone call review before the signing meeting where we send you the trust and we can go over it all before everything's signed. Um, and then there's really just a few follow-up meetings after that. But I would say we set the first, at, at, after the very first phone call where we just, and there's a green light, you know, let's go for it. Maybe three weeks to schedule the signing date. And then we can draft stuff. And then you, if you have property, you would need to, you know, get a copy. That's homework. You'd have to get a copy of your deed and get that to us um, so that we can kind of start that process of changing the property deed into the name of your trust. Great. Uh, what are like the average costs of uh, helping with all these services? Right, right. It's, uh, so it's, there's different costs, right? Um, and different attorneys charge different things. I know some of my colleagues will charge one or two months of a nursing home, which would be, you know, twenty thousand um, dollars. You know, there's different people are charging different things. Uh, we charge three grand, the three grand to set it all up, and then if there is a, it's basically like a substitute for long-term care insurance. It's a one-time payment, and and there you go. If there is a nursing home event, you're still saving in probate fees, which is you know four percent of the state. And you're still saving in taxes, which because you get the step up basis. And then you just make it easier on your beneficiaries because they don't have to go to court with that delay. They just get it all. Um, but yeah, 3000 that includes the deed, the you know power of attorneys, the trust, just everything. The trust, uh, all the state plan documents are kept with the client. You know, we'll, you know, we, we can have a copy, we keep a copy. Um, obviously on our computer, you know, where we drafted it. Um, but we do ask clients to keep it in like a fireproof box, you know, or something, you know, somewhere safe. I'm not really a fan of safe deposit boxes because at death banks kind of get funny or they'll freeze it, you know, and then the heirs can't get into it. So just keep your documents somewhere safe. And then uh, we also recommend uh, we don't charge for phone calls. 
And so we recommend having a lifetime relationship where if there's an emergency, an accident, a death, or you know, a disability, just reach out and check in to see if there's anything that we need to do, see if there's anything you need to do. Um, you may have some questions. Uh, I was just on the phone earlier and I, I, I let the couple know that if you know your health you know starts to decline, that's a wonderful time to give us a call, right? right? Because you know, you could call every five years or three years, but I say if there's a big change in circumstances or your health changes, just do a do a do a check-in with your elder law attorney. Any other questions? If you're muted, be sure to unmute or write it in the chat. Okay. Can I ask my question now? Sure. Okay. So um, you were, when you were saying about um, um, avoiding probate, I didn't understand because you said, of course, if you have a trust, that avoids probate. But you said if you have a will, it has to go through probate. Well, I have a will telling my POA that everything's in the trust. Does the will yeah, so mean that you have to have probate? If you have a trust and a will, yeah. your will is probably called a pour over will, which just directs everything to the trust. So if you have yeah. a trust and everything is titled in the name of the trust, you won't have to go through probate. Okay. The, the will that you have is refer. it's thought of more as a backup will. Like, let's say that because I, one of my clients, uh, their kid calls. And mom and dad passed away. And I said, well, how's everything titled? And they said, everything's in the name of the trust. Okay, you don't go through probate. And then he said, well, he said, my dad had this old Corvette he worked on and he had that car title that was in his individual name. Well, we had that backup will that said everything goes to my trust. So we had to do a quick probate to get that car into the name of the trust. So... Oh. Everything will not go through probate unless you left something out of your trust. You know, and, and most common pe things people leave out of the trust is like a bank account, maybe, or a vehicle or an individual stock. Um, those are sorts of things that people forget to put in the name of the trust or that, you know, they buy, sell things and they don't always have it titled correctly. You don't want to be disabled or in uh, or pass away with things in your individual name if you're trying to avoid probate. Now, if you have a trust and you're the trustee, it's not going to shield the assets from the spend down from the nursing home. So you have two goals, probate and nursing home protection, right? And not, not you, but I'm just saying just people in general have two goals. They want to avoid probate and they want to avoid having to spend their assets down on the cost of medical care, the nursing home. If you're the trustee of your trust, you will achieve the probate avoidance, but you're not going to achieve the nursing home protection. So the only way to get both is you create a special kind of trust, an asset protection trust, where you designate somebody else as the trustee and you maintain the right to change the trustee. Nick, is that called a revocable trust mm -hmm. or, an, or an irrevocable trust? An irrevocable trust. Irrevocable trust. Okay. But, but the irrevocable word is not as strict as you might think. There are different kinds of irrevocable trust. The irrevocable asset protection trust that we're talking about, even though it has the word irrevocable in it, you still can change two things in the irrevocable trust. You can change the trustee anytime you want, and you can change the beneficiary. Oh. Even though it's irrevocable, you still have the you have control over it. Okay. Well, is that um, having someone else as the trustee? Is that what you said has to happen five years before you need the? Oh, I see. Yeah. Oh, okay. That's that's new to me. Yeah. Yeah, the five-year look back is 
come all over the country. Um, years ago, I think it was three, but it's it's five now. Um, so can that somebody else be the financial advisor that's holding the trust? Well, they'd be someone else can be the trustee who's over the trust assets. And like, let's say you had a, a, a financial account and you had real estate in the name of your trust. You would need a property deed where you would need the trust signed by the trustee, like, you know, your kid or somebody like that. And then that gets filed at the courthouse and you really don't need the trustee unless you, you know, plan on selling your house. You don't need your trustee. You know, it's just kind of a one time you get them to sign the deed. The brokerage account is very similar to you just have them sign the paperwork and then that's about it. So you don't need much involvement from the trustee. You know, again, unless you're like buying and selling things every year or trading, you know, a bunch of stuff every year. But you you might not want to put those into the trust anyways. And that's where the consultation is going to be important, right? It's kind of hard to get it all covered in this, you know, Zoom meeting, but um yeah, you you would you would want to designate somebody else as the trustee and do that well in advance if you can, 5 years. And again, if you make it 4 years or 3 years, you just self-pay until you get past that 5-year mark. And then you got the protection. Otherwise, it's not protected. And when you're talking about, you know, there's lots of different scenarios for people versus long-term care. Like, it doesn't have to be fully skilled, fully whatever. You know, some of those options are cheaper, like if they had some help in the home. Um like their activities of day living aren't fully like incapacitated. They're more like, you know, stepstone. But the, the Medicaid's not going to pay for home care. Okay. They're only going to pay for the skilled gotcha. care. Yeah. Same for assisted or independent. Any yeah, of that just stuff? skilled, just the skilled nursing facility. They're okay. not going to pay. They're not going to pay for the assisted or independent living. Gotcha. Yeah. And uh, what what documents or questions or things should people have before they have that first phone call with you or whoever? Um, just to have a general idea of what their assets are what the value is you know because usually the questions are like what's your what's what do you pay for your your home what's the market value of your house um who do you want to be you know your power of attorney who do you want to be your beneficiaries um what are your retirement account values you know just general you know has, you can be conservative with the numbers just we just try to get a ballpark you know what's the balance of the checking savings um, do you own any CDs or stocks? Do you own any timeshares, right? You know, th those are common type of questions. So as long as you have the ability to answer those, you'll get the most value out of the meeting. And so some people will print off, you know, their statements and maybe they'll get a copy of their will or get a copy of their property deed. But nothing's required for the first of all, because if we decide that there's something that we need to do, we decide to go forward, um, homework can be assigned at that time. The first talk is just that, you know, it's just a, it's just a conversation. Looks like we got an iPad coming in. If this is a person, we're about wrapping it. <laughs> Hi, Margaret. Hi, how you doing? Good. Hello, Margaret. We we recorded this session, so um, I'll be sending it to everybody once it's uh, saved to my computer because oh, we're, okay. we're kind of wrapping up. So. Oh, okay, great. <laughs> so uh, I'll be getting a copy and I'll listen to it then. There you go. Well, and, it's nice uh, to meet you. <laughs> nice to meet you. And Mar Margaret, if you want to uh, say or text, if you had a specific you know type of question you wanted, um, otherwise, if it's a broad topic, you know, you'd get a lot of value, I think, out of watching the video we just did. Okay, great. I think it's more broad content, right? My husband's next to me. Okay. Yeah, I think it's more a broad topic. And, and we're include... a little bit late. Sorry about that. That's okay. No and I'll include Nick's phone number and email in the link to the recording as well. So, uh... okay. All right, great. Okay, thank you. Thank you. All right, see you guys. Okay, bye. bye.
Thanks, Nick. This is great. Thank, Thank you. you. Appreciate it, everybody.